building the frigate Essex. Um, this is something that I've been interested in for a while, and uh, I've been doing a little bit of reading about over the past uh, about a year now. Um, I'm, I'm not going to be publishing anything like that, so so don't get your hopes up. But um, it's something I've been pretty excited about, and I wanted to share some of my uh, you know discoveries with you folks. Um, we're going to start with obviously uh, why they built the frigate, and then ultimately we're going to end with her leaving Salem Harbor. Um, so we're not really going to get beyond that. It's really going to focus on that building period. Um, the image we have here is one of my favorite watercolors of the Essex uh, cruising, uh, I'm presuming, through the Atlantic, um, painted by a British uh, a Royal Navy commander, in fact. Um, and I think that's really captures the beauty of this, this pretty impressive vessel. So ultimately, um, do I have to mute? Can I have to hide that? Can you guys see behind that? There we go. Um, between a rock of Gibraltar and a hard place, why did the U.S. Navy need to subscribe for vessels? Why weren't they able to, to build their own vessels? Why did they need a Navy to defend our trade? Um, basically, well, we won the American Revolution and we lost all of the British tribute payments to the Barbary Pirates. Um, as you can see on the map on the right there, the Barbary Pirates on the North African coast, they had been uh, there for a long, long time, uh, paying tribute to the Ottoman Empire for, at this point, almost a thousand years. And uh, they were the pirates of the Mediterranean in many cases. And uh, they would capture British, French, Italian, uh, Ottoman, in some cases, uh, uh, Venetian vessels. And uh, they would tribute them back. Um, they would demand tribute uh, either uh, for peace or for the returning of the crews. Um, and uh, obviously, uh, it got expensive. And in many cases, the European countries, uh, not wanting to spend that money, um, they basically just would either fight or they would spend. It, it really depended. But the problem never went away. And ultimately, when America started having to, uh, to deal with it, um, it was difficult. Um, another major issue that led up to the creation of, of the ship was the Jay Treaty. Um, ultimately, we, were at, we had peace with Britain, and simultaneously, we were heading towards war with France. And the Jay Treaty in 1795, it was to reaffirm that, that um, the, the Treaty of Paris, that wasn't fully resolved at the end of the revolution. And um, one of the main concessions of that was that um, but the French, they viewed that really as, as an abrogation of our, of our alliance. And uh, ultimately, that, that relationship deteriorated further and further. And uh, other incidents such as the uh, Citizen Genet affair, uh, the XYZ affair, um, basically they were demanding bribes. The French were demanding bribes of the United States government. And uh, ultimately, that did not go over very well with the Washington administration. And uh, of course, Thomas Jefferson resigned um, from his post as the Secretary of State due to that. And um, those were some of the things that were, that were really causing this to come to a head. And ultimately, the Quasi-War did officially start. The British, uh, the, the French authorized their privateers to go out and start capturing American vessels uh, in the Atlantic Ocean uh, starting from 1797. And um, that was really one of the main things that got the Salemites to, to start realizing we needed to protect our ships because if we could not trade, we had no way of making money. So creating an American Navy. Uh, at the outset of the Quasi-War, um, May and June of 1798, uh, the U.S. had absolutely no operational naval vessels. The last U.S. naval frigate, um, the USS Alliance, was actually sold in 1785. And so at that point, there was no naval uh, force. And so they had uh, ultimately designated the USS Constitution, USS United States, and the Constellation um, to be built. Uh, originally, six frigates were called for. They had built three of them. The hulls were finished. Uh, unfortunately, even after being launched in 1797, they were not fully outfitted until July of 1798. So during this period, there was just no protection on the Atlantic Ocean for any American sailor. And uh, at that point now, um, things were getting very, very tense. Uh, there was uh, hundreds of vessels that were being captured by the French, and uh, not to mention the Barbary pirates at the same time. And uh, the Salem citizens, they really were looking to protect themselves. And uh, the image in the background there is the USS Constitution being launched. And that's largely what most of these vessels look like about almost a year after they were launched. Um, you know, the hulls were finished, but they were not outfitted with guns. They were not outfitted with their masts. And uh, that was what took uh, almost as long as the building period for some of those original six frigates. What got this whole thing to start? Um, well, the Salemites, they knew they wanted to defend themselves. And in fact, there was the, uh, the Navy Act, uh, the, the Act of June 30th, 1798, um, authorized by the Fifth Continent, by the Fifth United States Congress. And it authorized the U.S. Navy to accept armed vessels uh, offered by private citizens uh, for compensation. And it was in government-backed certificates. And interestingly enough, uh, Benjamin Stoddart, who was the Secretary of the Navy, he understood this to mean new vessels. The folks here in Salem, one of the wealthiest families, the Crown and Shields, uh, they had a different understanding. And in fact, upon hearing of this June 30th Act, um, they proposed donating or, or selling. It's, it's a little vague on what their, their understanding of what the offer was. 
um, initially one ship, the ship America, which was a massive vessel, um, probably pushing 600 tons. In fact, um, as you can see from the map at the bottom, way too big for Salem Harbor. Um, Derby Wharf uh, wasn't quite as long in the map that we have there, but uh, regardless, getting uh, any ship from the you know, Salem Harbor proper around Derby Wharf and then uh, over to Union Wharf or, or later on um, uh, um, Pickering Wharf, um, that was one of the main problems that the Crown Shield faced. So they thought they could get rid of this kind of white elephant around their neck, donate the ship to the United States Navy, um, but it wasn't to be. And, and uh, this, this misunderstanding really between uh, uh, Benjamin Stoddart and the Crown and Shields led to a little bit of uh, sour grapes, um, as is often described uh, with the Crown and Shield family. And really one of the main things that kind of disillusioned the Crown and Shields um, initially to some of the Federalists uh, in Salem, because it was definitely um, a little bit of a family rivalry too, as, as folks know, popped up later on. The um, Ship America, as I said, it couldn't fit the wharf. Um, and even after um, being rebuffed on an initial offer, uh, the Crown and Shields came back with a second offer, uh, the ship that's in the top right, uh, the beautiful vessel, the Belisarius. And uh, both paintings there by, done by a very famous uh, uh, artist who, who did many vessels, uh, a Frenchman, uh, Michel Felice Cornet. And um, unfortunately, neither vessel was ever given to the United States. And this uh, uh, sour grapes uh, feeling from the Crown and Shields family really held back in large part a lot of the subscription um, throughout the summer of, of 1798. If you know that someone in your town is trying to give two ships, you're probably not going to give money when you think these ships are going to be accepted. And so there was a lot of confusion about really, you know, were these ships going to be given? Are we going to do a subscription? And so ultimately it didn't really get started uh, until later on in the summer. And so the bill as it was written was for 6% stock in vessels now building or to be built. And uh, that was written into the law. And of course, that does not allow for um, vessels that are already built as, as, the under, as the Crown and Shield understanding of it would be. And so, like I said, the Crown and Shield offer, it really stifled that initial subscription drive in July at only $15,000, which was really quite a pittance at the time. Um, some of the leading men in the town had only donated $5,000 a piece, Elias Derby, uh, William Gray, who ultimately doubled their, uh, their, their subscriptions later on. Um, it really was held back quite a bit at the beginning um, by that Crown and Shield offer. Uh, of course, through late summer, July, and into August of 98, um, Reverend William Bentley, of course, uh, up there with his bully pulpit, uh, really getting uh, other people into town. Um, I imagine putting a little bit of a guilt trip on them, and uh, not to mention uh, Secretary of State Timothy Pickering, uh, one of my very big fan, one of my favorite guys from Salem's history, and uh, another uh, gentleman, uh, Benjamin Goodhue, uh, who was in fact on the ground in Salem. And uh, Timothy Pickering wrote a number of letters to, uh, to Goodhue, and, and Goodhue was more or less acting as his mouthpiece um, here in Salem while Pickering was down in Philadelphia. Pickering was one who was the real proponent uh, for United States Navy, in fact. And um, Pickering, in fact, um, besides just advocating for these naval vessels, to be, a, a naval vessel to be built in Salem, he actually proposed a list of 10 names, of which six of them were picked for those original frigates. So the USS Constitution, the Constellation, the Congress, the Chesapeake, and the president um, were all actually proposed by Colonel Timothy Pickering, interestingly enough. So uh, you can thank him for the name of our immortal vessel uh, down in the, the Charleston Navy Yard. And um, in picking, um, in a Pickering letter to Sauter, uh, in fact, he goes on and on about the size of the vessel to be built in Salem. Uh, Pickering was very much, um, again, proposing uh, that this to happen. Um, interestingly enough, though, he does argue quite extensively, almost a full page in one of these letters, about the, the benefits of carronades. And um, if anybody knows the ending of the Frigate Essex story, uh, you will know that carronades are ultimately one of the things that uh, did not work out so well for her. Um, but that's a story for another lecture another day. But um, I'll, I'll give you a little teaser for the next one. So uh, you'll see on the chart on the right-hand side there, um, some of the leading people and some of the smaller people uh, who subscribed um, to the Salem um, Frigate subscription. Of course, the two of the wealthiest men in the town, Derby and Gray, uh, John Norris as well too. Um, many of these men serving on the, uh, the frigate committee. Um, additionally, um, some of the smaller folks, you see some of the interesting professions, um, grog and victuals, sail makers donating their, their, you know, to the prescription in work, um, gun carriage maker, uh, James Gould, who would ultimately in fact build the carriages for the frigate Essex's cannons. Um, really, uh, uh, it, it covered everybody in the town, and the amounts, as you see, they range from $10 all the way to $10,000, so it was quite the community effort. And uh, the initial meeting, in fact, took place on October 19th, after all the money had been donated, of course, the subscribers got together to vote on a number of issues. Uh, they had to decide the size and the armament of the vessel that they were going to build, um, the uh, June 30th Act, 
um, allowed for either a 60, an 18 gun brig, um, a two masted vessel, or a 32 gun ship, a three masted uh, square rig vessel, uh, very much uh, as we picture in that first image and, and like friendship, like the Constitution. When I say the word ship, it refers to a three masted vessel uh, with square rig sails, as in sails that are pointing towards the front of the ship, not sails that are running uh, on a, you know, um, a parallel to the ship. Perpendicular uh, is, is square rig. Um, is one of the things to keep in mind. But again, you'll, you'll see, uh, not a whole lot of images of brigs, but um, Salem, having raised so much money, ultimately almost $75,000, um, they decided that they could easily afford, uh, maybe not easily, but they did afford, they could afford a 32-gun ship, a, a frigate, as it was going to be called. And uh, they also voted on the members of the committee, who would be William Bray, of course, one of the head uh, donors, uh, Jacob Ashton, um, Benjamin Hodges, who was, in fact, the business partner of uh, Ichabod Nichols. So those two men were some of the leading merchants in the town. And then Benjamin Pickman, uh, who interestingly enough was a Tory uh, during the revolution, hightailed it out of Salem uh, and Boston and then ultimately returned in 1785 to a, a pretty warm reception. Um, he ended up serving as the city of Salem or the town of Salem's treasure and then ultimately as well for the, as the treasurer for the, um, for the Frigate Essex uh, uh, Committee. Oh, of course, they had to select a designer and a superintendent. Although interestingly enough, um, there was not a whole lot of options. There were a few different um, uh, designers and superintendents of ships, uh, many of them uh, working up along the Merrimack River or around Portsmouth, uh, similarly down on the South Shore near Pembroke. And um, they had a few different people in mind, but there was really one guy who came very quickly to mind, and uh, it didn't take them very long to, to make an offer and reach out to him. So William Hackett uh, was undoubtedly the first man who came to mind. Um, he was from Salisbury, Massachusetts, um, had done much work uh, on other naval vessels uh, previously in his career uh, up around the Portsmouth area. In fact, his cousin James Hackett um, ended up being the superintendent of the Portsmouth Naval Yard. And he had another brother, uh, John Hackett, um, who he assisted on uh, a number of vessels as well, too. And some of the famous ships that they designed are the, the Massachusetts Navy Brigantines, uh, Massachusetts and Tyrannicide. Uh, the Sloop Ranger that was made famous by John Paul Jones, uh, the Frigate Alliance, which I mentioned previously as one of the ships, which um, ultimately was the only vessel to survive the entire American Revolution. It was the only frigate to last all the way through the Revolution and was ultimately broken up for scrap in 1785. And uh, the ship of the line America, uh, one of the largest vessels built um, before 1800 in, in, uh, in the United States, um, it was a, a two-deck um, ship of the line, ultimately a much larger vessel than a frigate. Um, it was not to be, however, because the ship was donated to France uh, almost as soon as it was outfitted um, in exchange for a, a French vessel that had unfortunately um, crashed and sunk in, in Boston Harbor. And then lastly, the sloop Merrimack, which he completed almost immediately before um, agreeing to work on the frigate Essex. And in fact, um, the frigate Essex commission would be the highlight of his career. Interestingly enough with William Hackett, as they often and say about you know genius um it often flirts with madness and in this case um he did struggle with mental illness later on in life and um, we're not exactly sure of course what he had but it could have been maybe bipolar disorder or or some type of personality disorder um, but he was ultimately condemned only about eight years after completing this job um, around 1807 1808 he was declared a distracted person by the state of massachusetts and so um ultimately going under the care of the state by then and, and no longer able to work um, of course, the images at the bottom showcasing a number of the ships that I just mentioned. The other gentleman uh, was Enos Briggs of Salem. And uh, he's one of my uh, favorite guys in all of this. He was an incredible ship carpenter. Um, just starting off down in Pembroke on the North River, another area of uh, uh, significant shipbuilding activity. In fact, um, Elias Haskett Derby uh, often conscripted um, or, or contracted uh, North River shipwrights uh, to build many of his vessels, including the massive 560-ton East Indiaman Grand Turk in 1790. And that was not the same vessel that did the famous privateering, and again, the third vessel to China. Um, that was the previous Grand Turk, a 300-ton vessel. Um, and uh, to replace that ship as she got a little older, to make a little bit more money, um, Derby hired Briggs to build that ship almost adjacent to his Derby wharf um, that he owned there. And if you're looking at the image below, uh, that is, in fact, a detail of the Salem Marine Society certificate that many folks have seen before. And uh, the Marine Society, um, obviously being uh, one of the longest lasting maritime societies in the country, um, they showcase one of the oldest shipyards that was here in Salem. 
uh, and uh, one of the longest lasting. And the foreground there, you'll see there's a little house and uh, a fence leading down to the water. If my uh, uh, estimations on the map appear correct, then I would say that that house is almost the exact site of the entrance to Shetland Park and uh, the Delhi House Pizza, and additionally, uh, the Pequot House, uh, as it's known, uh, named after the Pequot Mills. So effectively, we'd be standing uh, kind of in the parking lot um, over near the Congress Street Bridge, um, looking over, of course, to Salem Harbor. And you can see down on the left-hand side, uh, right along the coast, in fact, are some ships' ways. So I got a question here coming in. What was going on? Oh. What was going on in Maryland, New York, Virginia during this building of the Navy? Um, in fact, they were doing some of their own things. There were subscription vessels being built uh, all up and down the coast. Um, of course, the Philadelphia was one of the famous ones. Uh, Norfolk, Virginia as well. Um, of course, in New Hampshire, um, many of these other towns. Even in fact, um, the Merrimack was a subscription vessel. That, that It was an 18-gun brig uh, built in Newburyport um, by William Hackett and his brother James. So many communities, of course, many communities that were making their money from the coast. Um, they were ultimately, you know, outfitting their own vessels. And um, Carolyn sent me a question privately as well, too. Uh, what happened um, to these ships after they were decommissioned? Um, the naval vessels, not often. Um, the naval vessels, in many cases, were turned over to the United States Navy uh, as property. Um, they were not, the, the subscription um, for these ships was not designed as a loan. It really was a, a sale, uh, an investment, uh, so to speak. You know, you would receive your your government stock um, a few years after paying into the subscription and um, the ship was owned by the U.S. Navy and ultimately they were you know dis disassembled or used until uh, they were no longer useful. Um, so it was more of the privateers that would transition back into the, um, the, you know, the private role of East Indiaman traders in many cases and of course sometimes they kind of skirted the line. Uh, many of these East Indiaman traders um, either during the Revolutionary War, the Quasi War, or the War of 1812, um, they would also serve as privateers. Um, a trading ship without cannons uh, is a very easy target. And um, many of those uh, private ship owners would outfit their own ships um, ultimately with cannon and making it legal with a letter of mark. And um, they would kind of skirt the line between a trading ship and a naval vessel. Um, they were even allowed to capture prizes, in fact. And so uh, that was really where you'd hear the, the bouncing back and forth between a, a privateer, truly a ship of war, um, and then also a, uh, uh, an East Indian. But then uh, these American vessels, particularly the subscription ships, they never returned um, to trade. So with Enos Briggs, um, there were a few other guys in Salem who could have done the job. Uh, one of the other names that people may recognize from, from Salem's history is Retire Beckett. Uh, Retire Beckett Shipyard was uh, approximately between the House of the Seven Gables and the Salem Maritime National Historical Site. Um, the exact site of it, I'm not sure of, but unfortunately, Retire Beckett, um, he was a very competent shipbuilder, but he had a very, he had a, a habit of, of really poor and sloppy launches. Um, many of his, his launches would get stuck on the ways, and um, given that that could actually cause damage to a larger vessel, um, that was something that they weren't always sure he could do. And in fact, his position, uh, where his shipyard was located, on Salem Harbor, um, if you look out over um, the area between Salem Maritime uh, and, you know, Derby Wharf, and then ultimately uh, the House of the Seven Gables, that is an extensive mudflat, and uh, it was not much deeper back in the day, and so that main issue, um, along with the fact that, you know, Beckett, off, he actually had three commissions that he did in 1799, so he was quite the busy guy that year, um, I think ultimately precluded him, and then the third gentleman besides Briggs was a gentleman, Ebenezer Mann, um, whose shipyard was over on the North River. Um, probably close to Blubber Hollow is today, and uh, Ebenezer Mann, unfortunately, was regarded as a little bit of an eccentric, and I think was pretty quickly discounted off of the list of, of possible carpenters. Um, Briggs ultimately was the man for the job, though. He was an incredible carpenter, a ship carpenter, um, designed many other vessels besides the Essex, and uh, this was the, you know, the, the, the beginning of a very long career. And so, um, just to give a few dates too, um, during the design phase, um, so October 23rd was the first meeting, uh, was, was the second meeting, they confirmed the committee. The next day, on the 24th, the offer letter was sent to William Hackett by the Newburyport coach. Um, so almost immediately, uh, they had selected their man uh, to design it. And then uh, about a week later, uh, on October 30th, Hackett meets with the frigate committee, he comes down to Salem, and uh, he enters into contract formally as the designer and the superintendent. Um, less than a week after that, 
William Gray and Hackett visit the Boston Frigate Committee, uh, which had actually been working on the ship Boston, the USS Boston, um, that was uh, being built simultaneously with the Frigate Essex and in fact created a little bit of a competition for resources. Um, but who better to confer with than uh, the folks who were doing the same exact thing in the same neighborhood, um, ultimately for the same purpose. And uh, a little bit of a friendly rivalry developed. It, it, it never got any more serious than that. Um, and of course, they, they got a lot of the groundwork of the logistics um, from the Boston Frigate Committee. Uh, a couple days later, uh, William Hackett returns to Salisbury to begin his designs. And again, less than a week after that, on November 13th, William Hackett visits Salem uh, for a consultation with Enos Briggs, who by then had been consult, who had been uh, confirmed as the, uh, the master carpenter. And the design at that point, it was far enough along for Briggs to determine how much lumber he was going to need to build. And um, in fact, no formal plans for the Essex were, were actually you know, drafted at all until July of 1799. And so there's been a little bit of wonder about how William Hackett designed the ship um, that was a very, very large vessel, ultimately the largest ship ever built in Salem, and how he did this without actually having any blueprints, having you know drafted plans. Um, it's very likely he would have had a, a wooden, you know, bread and butter hull, of, you know, the thin slices of wood um, all glued together like that um, to form the hull, and, and he would have had some way of showing his his design. And uh, obviously, the back and forth between Briggs and Hackett. Um, was, was definitely uh, one of the things that allowed this to, to, to get off the ground. Um, if these two men did not, were not able to work together, uh, this project would not have gone forward. And ultimately, they seem to have worked very well together. And uh, even Briggs, without any formal designs for really the first half of the building process, um, it did not seem to have hold, held him up at all. Uh, Briggs really understood um, the design that Hackett had in mind. And um, in fact, that, of the delays that occurred, um, almost none of them were between um, Hackett and Briggs. And that was one of the things that really allowed the project to move along quite well. There we go. And so here are in fact, um, the official plans of the USS Essex. And uh, you can see she was a, a pretty large vessel. Just to give you a, a kind of point of comparison, um, the friendship of Salem would be about maybe 15 to 20 percent smaller in terms of the hull size uh, than the frigate Essex. Um, so if you're looking at uh, you know the, the, the side sideboard here um, of the ship, it's it's uh, about 15 20 percent larger, um, but otherwise a very very similar design. One of the chief things though that was different was um, in the middle of the ship where you see all the cannons um, all lined up with the gun ports. Um, that was in fact the main deck. Um, there was a spar deck that went above that. Um, that was considered, you know, the forecastle, the forecastle, um, the gangway that connected it in the middle, and then the quarter deck uh, towards the stern of the ship. So that upper deck of the ship, in fact, um, the weather deck, the spar deck, um, it, it served all those purposes there. Um, in fact, that was not the highest, uh, that was the highest deck, but it was not, it, it was actually not, it was open to the air is what I'm trying to say. Um, so that middle section there, if you look on the bottom one, the, uh, the, the inboard profile, um, you can see the capstan uh, right there in the middle. Um, that was actually open to the air. And so it's very different than the frigate uh, constitution and uh, very, very different than the, uh, than the friendship of Salem in that regard. It did have that open chasm in the middle there, which allowed a little bit more air in. And ultimately when you're firing the cannons to get that smoke out so you could actually see your target better. So how did they build it? Uh, what did they build it from? Um, very quickly, Enos Briggs uh, put out a call for lumber in the Salem Gazette. And uh, I'm not going to read the whole thing there, but he was specifically looking for white oak. And if anybody has visited the Pickering House before, you will have seen some of the most incredible white oak beams uh, still in existence in Essex County. Um, I'm going to go on a limb and say that this is the same type of wood that was being used in the Frigate Essex, uh, specifically swamp white oak. And um, you can see from the image in the middle there, these are massive trees. Um, in many cases, uh, 100 feet tall, um, as, much, as wide as 100 feet as well, um, and exceptionally, exceptionally strong. Uh, I don't have to go on uh, much more if you've been to the Pickering House and seen it. Um, the wood and the quality there is just, it's second to none. And in fact, in 1807, uh, Josiah Fox, uh, who is the head of the Washington Naval Yard at the time uh, during the Frigate Essex's reconstruction, uh, he acknowledged that there was nothing he could do to improve the framing of the ship. And that again speaks to the absolute incredible quality of that swamp, of what I believe to be uh, swamp white oak. 
And then uh, it went pretty fast, in fact. Um, just shortly after the November 23rd call, um, about the November 25th and 26th, there was a massive nor'easter storm. And all of that snow being on the ground, it made it very easy for sleighs and sledges to carry that, that, that wood, which was largely being harvested from Danvers, Topsfield, uh, Boxford area, uh, maybe even as far west as Middleton and, and possibly even Wilmington, but mostly uh, on, you know, middle and northern Essex County, um, not quite as far as, as the Merrimack River, um, but that really that main area in the middle of Essex County where there's still quite a few rural farms. Um, if anybody has been to the Appleton Farms and Ipswich, I, there's a quite a few uh, really large white oak trees there, and, and that's largely the situation that I'm picturing these trees having been, uh, been growing in. And so four weeks later, uh, January 11th, 1799, um, this was the, the call for wood was full. Um, they had brought all the wood through downtown Salem, in fact, uh, the staging area in the middle of town uh, at the current site of William Driver Park, uh, right opposite the Witch House. Um, the wood was staged there quickly, it was measured, and then ultimately it was brought down to Union Wharf uh, for transportation over to, uh, for, from Union Wharf to transportation over to Winter Island proper. And um, how do we know it was gonna be a Winter Island? Well, they needed to find somewhere to build the ship. Um, when you're building an 850 ton vessel, and previously the largest ship that had built, been built in Salem was 560 tons, uh, of course, the Grand Turk, and launched with quite a bit of difficulty over that mud flat, they realized that nowhere on the inner harbor was going to work, and, and nowhere even along the main part of the town. In fact, the only area that really would work uh, for building and launching a vessel of this size was going to be Winter Island. Of course, uh, right out of the mouth of Salem Harbor, very, very quick uh, um, uh, drop in depth uh, down to around the, you know, 15, 20, 30 feet, uh, as you can see down there in the foreground with all the sailboats. Uh, it's still used as an anchorage today. Uh, that has not changed. It's, it's, it's really a common sense place um, to, to store and use vessels, and obviously it still serves that purpose today. And you can see the arrow uh, right there. That is almost the, that is in fact the exact location um, through a number of sources. Uh, uh, there has been, no, unfortunately, no archaeology that has been done down there. Um, by the time that, that anybody thought to do a, a, an archaeological survey, um, the, the seaplane base had already been built by the United States Coast Guard. And so with that in mind, um, if somebody ever wanted to petition the city to, to um, I'm not going to say remove anything, but to maybe, you know, take a look around that area, that is really where you would likely find uh, evidence of the shipbuilding activity. And in fact, she was uh, launched later on, almost at that exact angle, um, coming down the hill, uh, across the lawn there, and then um, right through what's now the, uh, the I would call it maybe the boathouse or the clubhouse on Winter Island. And then of course, uh, right past what's now the boat ramp, and then out into Salem Harbor. And so looking down the hill here, this is almost right in line, you know, directly in line with where the frigate Essex would have been oriented um, on her ways as the uh, construction commenced. And so, of course, all the lumber being brought out there, all of the um, iron fastenings, um, there were a number of different people involved with this. Um, you couldn't even begin to count uh, thousands of people involved in the carting and the transportation and the manufacture of all of these, uh, of all the necessary components. And um, Winter Island, uh, still quite a beautiful spot. Um, and interestingly enough, uh, one of the few areas in Salem that has had very, very little change. Um, it really does look almost identical in terms of its coastline to how it would have in 1799, with the exception of that, the current boat ramp, um, and um, obviously a few changes over on the, uh, the northern side of the islands near uh, Cat Cove and um, 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 Juniper Cove. Um, those are really the only areas that have had change. So this shoreline that we're looking at today is really the exact same as it would have looked to, uh, to Briggs and Hackett and um, a few of the other gentlemen uh, who, who looked to get the ship up off the ground. Of course, it was not all done entirely by people in Salem. Um, some of the early contracts, uh, both good and bad, um, that, that helped get this thing going. Um, one of the first ones that had to be established was for the spars. A spar is any member uh, of a ship, a, a mass, um, a, a, the yards, um, the bowsprit that supports the sails or the rigging. And the rigging, again, is the running lines of the ship um, that help you know, control the mass, help raise the sails. Um, all of that, again, is, is, is integral to a ship. And so having those, those raw spars being made of, of, of you know, good, effective wood um, was an important thing. And uh, more importantly than that, the quick delivery of those uh, to the next guy in the chain was also going to be important. And from all records, uh, Jonathan Hamilton and Nathaniel Guptill 
uh, got tail uh, of, of Barrick, Maine. Um, they contracted and delivered effectively on time every time. Um, they, they did not hold up the process. There was no mention of them um, having held up any elements of this uh, construction. Um, the most important guy in all of this, uh, unfortunately, gets kind of short shrift on this slide here because, well, he doesn't have a portrait. Um, I can't find his grave. Um, his name is Joseph Waters, and he was the one who was officially appointed as the United States Naval Agent. Of course, the, United, the Salem Frigate Committee was, was involved. They controlled the purse strings of the, the public funding, um, or, or I should say the private funding. And then uh, the Navy agent, he would be relying on the purse strings of either the Secretary of the Navy um, or the Bursar of the Navy. And uh, he ultimately was responsible for sourcing the remaining uh, um, elements of the ship, including you know, the cannons, the gunpowder, things that were not to be, to be supplied by the frigate subscription. And Joseph Waters um, was instrumental in getting the frigate Essex done on time and effectively right on budget. Um, and I'll be talking a lot more about him later on. Um, the famous gentleman we see on the right-hand side, uh, Mr. Paul Revere, who I oddly think looks quite a bit like Jack Black, um, I've, I've realized lately. Um, Paul Revere, uh, as famous as he was, uh, he did the agreement for the copper fasteners of the ship. Um, unfortunately, it was, I can't say it was a great contract because he was continually late. Um, the reason for him being late was either that he had overextended himself, um, there was also some possible miscommunications that had happened uh, from some other members of the frigate community, uh, from the Salem Frigate Committee. And uh, Paul Revere, he, he did get the job done, although um, he was occasionally creating delays due to lack of delivery of the product that he had promised. One of the main gentlemen who held the frigate Essex back uh, and, and delayed it was Luke Layton of Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Unfortunately, um, there was a miscommunication between Leighton and Ichabod Nichols of the, uh, of the frigate committee. And uh, Nichols, actually born of Salem, but raised in Portsmouth, of course, they sent him up there to go and uh, figure out um, who was the best, yeah, it definitely looks like Jack Black. Um, he was, uh, uh, Ichabod Nichols was sent up to Portsmouth to find out um, who would be the best man for the job. Unfortunately, the initial communications between the two um, Leighton understood it as a offer for a contract. Nichols understood it as a confirmed contract. And unfortunately, uh, Leighton did not hear anything back from either Nichols or even Waters until as late as May 9th. And so that really set him back uh, almost a, a two months, two full months at least, uh, maybe even three full months on delivering uh, the finished spars uh, and, and masts and yards. And so, of course, all that wood having come from Hamilton and Guptill and Maine, um, down the river, floated ultimately to, uh, to Portsmouth. Um, Leighton, unfortunately, um, either due to incompetence, um, overextension, or possibly, again, the delay uh, caused by, by, um, by Ichabod Nichols, um, he was continually late in getting his things uh, delivered to Salem. Um, interestingly, though, he was not the worst of the contracts. Uh, the worst of the contracts was a gentleman, Benjamin Seymour of Plymouth, Massachusetts. And Seymour contracted to create the shot, uh, the cannonballs, the grape shot, the bar shot. Um, he agreed to do so on May 29th. In fact, he did not complete his order until the week that the frigate Essex sailed from Salem. Um, he was habitually late. In fact, um, he continually overextended himself by agreeing to new and additional contracts. And um, he was a far better salesman than he was a manufacturer of grape shot or cannonballs. In fact, um, his real contribution to all this was that he actually didn't forge any of the cannonballs. Um, he didn't, he didn't uh, uh, create any of the cannonballs himself. He actually created molds and then subcontracted the work out to others. In fact, all of the cannonballs eventually ending up on the frigate Essex were made in New York. They were not made in Massachusetts. And so Seymour um, basically worming his way in there as a middleman um, and ultimately proved the, 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 the largest hindrance to getting the frigate Essex uh, out to sea and completed on time. Um, Mr. Waters, uh, of course, Joseph Waters, uh, having contributed the largest amount of effort uh, uh, to the frigate Essex, um, ultimately serving as the, um, the naval agent, uh, he was paid at 2% of all of the purchased goods and, 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 and equipment and, and supplies of the ship. Uh, that ended up being about fifteen hundred dollars, which um, fifteen hundred dollars of a seven thousand uh, of a seven five hundred dollar um, or seventy five thousand dollar project um, is not a significant amount of money. And um, 
Joseph Waters does not seem to have profited uh, largely uh, by his work on the frigate Essex, even though he, he was instrumental in getting it done um, as close to on time as it was, and uh, in fact, only about 1% over budget. Um, in fact, the, the total tally of the bill was um, $75,000 and around 7,500, 7, wow, I'm terrible right now, $75,500, which was only about $750 over the subscription amount. 1% over budget. In fact, less than 1% over budget. Um, excellent, excellent management of the money uh, uh, that was allocated by the town or was, it was subscribed by the town uh, to build the ship. And in fact, um, the house you're looking at there is the Caroline Emerton Settlement House. Uh, interestingly enough, it was built in 1807 by Captain Joseph Waters. Um, he lived there with his family for about two or three generations. His family lived there for about two or three generations until it was sold by the, to the Bertram family, and it was known as the Bertram home for, for aged men. And then not long after having um, had all the aged men in there, Carolyn Emerton bought the hall and was using it as her settlement hall. And that was uh, its purpose for, for many, many years until, of course, becoming you know, one of the settlement buildings of the House of the Seven Gables, and then today now private condominiums. Um, so it has quite an interesting history, but you can see um, Joseph Waters being able to build a house of that size, 1807, um, he clearly did well enough financially uh, to afford this. Um, it was not just the, the frigate Essex um, that he was making his money from. Uh, he had a few other ventures. Uh, he was a ship captain and master previously, and of course was investing in other vessels that were heading out and trading in the, in the Far East, uh, in Russia as well too. So um, he clearly did well for himself beyond uh, not making out very well on, the, uh, on all of his work for the frigate Essex. And of course, laying the keel. And uh, I am not going to claim to be an expert on uh, wooden shipbuilding, so I'm going to show you a video of some wooden shipbuilding. And um, here we go. This is, in fact, a clip uh, from 1947 of what I believe to be uh, the location that you're seeing here is the Burnham Shipyard. Um, if anybody knows the Burnham Shipyard in Essex, Massachusetts, I am pretty darn sure that that's exactly. Uh, where this ship is being built. And so uh, it's just a short little clip just to show you some of those initial steps. Of course, this vessel being much smaller than the Essex. Uh, but regardless, the construction of these wooden vessels, it didn't change really between um, 1797 and uh, 1947. It, it largely stayed the same. It's the day the keel of the St. Rosalie was turning. I wasn't the man on the yard that didn't mean to that day in building the ship was a great event. He was the backbone of the vessel. From here on, we are building up to see a ship come to life. The ribs, the hull, in the place. No man in the shipyard has just one job to do. Everyone must turn to a variety of tasks. Even the skilled draftsman lends a hand when rock and tackle are put to work. When you see the ribs line up, you can figure how important it is to have accurate design. Then you can see the pallet weeks, weeks of work. Vessel takes shape. Now you can tell how she how she arrived. So that gives you a little idea of how it would have come together. And so. There we go. So uh, the keel was ultimately laid on April 13th, and in fact, had no celebration or even an acknowledgement in the Salem Gazette. Um, interestingly enough, as much fanfare as the Essex received um, for the subscription and later on for the launching, um, no one acknowledged publicly, uh, besides some notes uh, that, are, that ultimately ended up in the Peabody Essex Museum collection, um, of when the date uh, that the keel was laid. And uh, around the same period, uh, the Frigate Essex Committee, they selected the name. Uh, of course, the huge contribution of lumber and materials uh, from the county Essex, where we're in, um, really prompted uh, the name to, to be selected that way. And then um, by late May, the Essex was in fact completely framed. Uh, the hull bottom was largely planked over and uh, much of the work on the exterior of the ship was well underway and they had started framing, um, or, or, or should they, laying out the interior of the ship, um, the oil of deck, um, the, um, the birthing deck, and then later on the gun deck. Um, so all of those would, would take place really through um, May, June, and into July. And then by mid-August, um, a lot of the major work had already been completed. 
this right here is intended to be overwhelming. Um, there is an incredible amount of work that goes into outfitting a ship beyond just building the structure of a ship. And you'll notice all of the uh, bolded and, and you know the darker black uh, um, uh, you know equipment features and the suppliers. All of those in bold were in fact local, right here in Salem. Uh, the duck, which was actually flax fiber uh, that was spun uh, in the Salem Duck Manufactory. Uh, the duck manufactory stood effectively across the street from the Pickering House, um, right behind uh, what's now Number One Broad Street and the J. Ru Michael J. Ruane uh, Senior Housing. Um, that is the site. Uh, what was the site of the Salem Duck Manufactory? Uh, spinning that that flax fiber uh, into a very very water resistant uh, sail cloth, and they ended up creating about 205 bolts. Um, the Salem Iron Manufactory as well uh, was one of the significant ones, um, along with Samuel Buffum and John Howard. Um, who contributed the finished sailcloth into finished sets of sails. Um, uh, Thomas Briggs uh, was one of the, uh, the cordage makers, one of the rope makers, uh, along with Jonathan Harridan, uh, who was quite famous as a Revolutionary War privateer. Um, Jonathan Harridan is, is uh, quite famous for anyone who knows uh, Revolutionary War naval history. Um, and uh, later on in life, uh, did settle down uh, back in Salem and uh, started a not too successful, but a, a fairly well off uh, rope walk. Um, that extended from about uh, uh, Brown Street down to about the end of the Brown of the Howard Street Cemetery. So approximately where um, the old Salem Jail is, um, that's now Bitbar. Um, basically going along from Brown Street down to there was where uh, uh, Jonathan Harrington had his little walk. Um, of course, Samuel McIntyre being one of the other uh, uh, big names you'll see on there. In fact, uh, known far better as a furniture maker and as an architect uh, than he was as a ship carver. Although in this case, he did uh, uh, not just the work on the Essex, but a few others, um, ultimately not known as the best ship carver in Massachusetts, um, but still having done the work for the Essex, uh, and we'll see a few images of that later on. Um, the guy at the very bottom there, Benjamin Feltz, um, known as a block maker, uh, and if anyone's not familiar, a block and tackle of a large you know, piece like this that has the, the, the pulleys through it, and you see the ropes running through it, that is a block, a block and tackle. And so uh, approximately 400 blocks were made of all the different sizes uh, by Benjamin Feltz here in Salem. And you can see some of the costs there along the side. And, and uh, I will give the shout out to my guy, uh, Philip Chadwick Foster Smith. Um, I wish I could give him a, a handshake and a high five. Uh, I believe he's, he's probably uh, long since passed. Um, but his book, uh, The Frigate Essex Papers, uh, is, is where I got almost all of this information. So uh, the duck, the flax fiber um, for the sail plot, the image there is actually a flax barn in, in, uh, in the Netherlands. Um, and in this case, um, shows the women. Um, there was about uh, two dozen women who were working in the Salem duck manufactory there, uh, spinning that duck fiber um, into, uh, as I said, the sail cloth. And uh, the gentleman who finished that uh, duck sail cloth into finished sails was Buffum and Howard. And uh, the portrait on the left is of John Howard. Um, John Howard, in fact, served in the revolution under the Glover Regiment. Um, he returned to Massachusetts and served as a privateer for the remainder of the Revolutionary War after Trenton. And um, his son, in fact, was also the painter of the only known contemporary painting of the Frigate Essex. Uh, so Mr. Howard, uh, we owe him quite a, uh, quite a lot of thanks uh, for his involvement um, in getting the Frigate Essex not just uh, outfitted with sails, but also uh, having created the son who was the painter uh, ultimately, who gave us the one image that we know exactly how the frigate Essex looked. So thank you, Mr. Howard. On the right hand there, um, it's just a great image I found of uh, uh, a sail loft. And um, we're not sure exactly when in the 1800s, it could have been even 18, as late as 1895. Um, but as with many of these things in the age of sail, it doesn't change. Um, the, the, the techniques, the tools, um, you know, the men who were in these prof professions, um, these things went down father to son for, for generations and generations. And uh, a sail walk like that would have looked the same as it had uh, in 1895, just as it would have had in 1795. The other place um, that was integral to uh, outfitting the Essex was the Salem Iron Factory, the Salem Iron Manufactory. And uh, the detail here is actually from uh, the Salem Iron Factory certificate. And if anyone is familiar with Waters Street heading into Danvers, um, we are basically looking at the site of what was the home for the deaf. Um, we're on the side that has the Dungan Donuts here. Uh, we're looking, uh, I would say, probably eastward, uh, uh, southeastward um, towards the ocean. You can see the vessels with the sails, of course, being on the ocean side of the bridge. 
And uh, the bridge there is basically today the Water Street Bridge in Danvers. Um, so that location is, is, is pretty well known uh, if anybody's on their way over to the market basket there or heading over to the, um, any of the hospitals along Endicott Street there. So this, this was a pretty important place where um, a lot of the iron was, was, uh, was forged uh, and then ultimately hammered out into these massive, massive anchors. Um, in fact, uh, seven of about the 10 ish anchors that were on the Essex were manufactured here uh, in the Salem Iron Manufactory. In fact, um, the Pam Bauer anchor is a really good example of one of these anchors that we would have seen on the bow, the Bauer, of course, uh, of the frigate Essex. And um, the Pem anchor is around 4,450 uh, pounds. Uh, the Bowers on the Essex were between 3,300 and 3,900 pounds. So the best Bower on the Essex would have been 3,900 pounds, the best bow anchor, um, and ultimately not a whole lot smaller uh, than the Essex, than the anchor that we have here in front of the Pem today. And so um, really picturing, you know, uh, uh, at least two of those on the bow, a couple of others uh, in the hold, um, and that was exactly what they would have been using um, to, to anchor the Essex after she had been launched. And of course, Samuel McIntyre, who uh, of course uh, we all know, um, the portrait of him there is uh, quite a famous one. You gotta you know, see what the man looked like. Um, in fact, for all of his work that we have, his, his, his uh, mantle pieces, the architecture here in Salem, um, you know, all kinds of impressive furniture, uh, we only have one example of any ship carving that he did. Uh, and it's a model of a figurehead um, from around 1790, 1795, so before the Essex uh, uh, was being built. Um, and uh, not, it, it's a beautiful, beautiful figurehead. Um, although regarded by many ship carvers at the time to have been subpar work, um, interestingly enough. Um, there were two gentlemen in Boston, Mr. Skillens of Boston uh, was widely regarded as the best ship carver in Massachusetts. And uh, much of the work that Elias Derby did was not going to McIntyre, but was actually going to Mr. Skillens in Boston. And so interestingly enough, um, our own hometown hero, wood carver, um, this was the most important job he ever did uh, in, in terms of ship carving, um, carving his figurehead, uh, as well as the trail boards, which would have gone from the, the front of the figurehead, you know, swooping back, ultimately to the stem. And then, of course, uh, on the stern of the ship, uh, the, the stern board there, um, as well as some other ornamental carvings and the quarter galleries. The figurehead of the Essex um, is known, actually, from the Joseph Howard watercolor. And uh, the detail you'll see on the right is uh, transcribed from the Essex papers. Um, interestingly though, there are not a lot of examples of the Indian figurehead, which was very, very popular in that exact style. Um, the one that was done by McIntyre, this Indian figurehead carved by McIntyre seems to have been a unique version. Um, many of the other ones uh, appear much more similar to the one on the left, which of course has many similarities. You can see uh, around his neck, um, you know, the, the, the necklace there, um, you can see the billowing cloak uh, in, the, in the watercolor there with him, you know, a stepping forward. Uh, of course, he's got his tomahawk um, over by his side, but in McIntyre's version, the tomahawk is up on his shoulder. Um, but otherwise, a very, very similar uh, representation, but not quite the exact same thing. Um, but regardless, though, this gives you a pretty good idea of what the, uh, the figurehead on the Essex likely looked like. One of the other major projects um, as the frigate, frigate Essex was coming along, of course, you can't have a ship without ballast. You need something to weigh down the hull of the vessel. And of course, um, iron ballast was desired most. Uh, beach shingle, um, usually the, 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 the round stones you'll find on a beach like Devereux Beach, in fact, which was a, a very well-known shingle, uh, shingle beach. Um, that was the, those were the two types of weight that you would put down in the hull of the ship. And uh, ultimately, you had to get that ballast um, either from Philadelphia, where much of the frigate Essex's ballast came from. It was a uh, iron pig iron ballast um, shipped up uh, on the cost of the U.S. Navy, and it was ultimately landed here on the right-hand side at what today looks like a pile of rocks. Um, as you can see from the uh, the map on the left-hand side, was a wharf. Um, I would have to say this is probably the closest. Um, or, or I would say the, the, the most original wharf in Salem uh, as it originally appeared, because well, these were really rudimentary structures in many cases. They were just boulders piled up on either side. Um, they would have uh, horizontal logs, uh, as you can see over along the top right hand side, right at the water line um, at the top of the, uh, the wharf there. Um, these were rudimentary structures, and in this case, uh, uh, the Derby Wharf, the Winter Island Wharf, as it should be called, um, it still exists today. And that was, in fact, the location of where all the iron Kentlidge was unloaded um, from Philadelphia 
and it was stored in a structure that would have actually been just to the right of where this photo was taken. And you could walk out there onto Winter Island, just past the Harbor Masters, um, the Harbor Masters hut there, and uh, you can still see the remains of uh, the Winter Island Wharf and the, the building that would have actually housed all of that iron templage before it was being loaded onto the frigate Essex. And uh, that map on the left hand side there, I forgot to give it a credit, but that is also uh, pulled from um, Philip Chadwick Foster Smith's uh, The Frigate Essex Paper. That is an original map that I, I need to give credit for. Um, and again, you can see point A right there on the map too, illustrating exactly where the, uh, the Frigate Essex wave would have been and, and where she would have been built and ultimately launched from. Launch day! Um, even before the ship was ready to launch, um, there were a few things that had to happen, of course. A lot of that iron ballast, that templage, had to be loaded into the hull of the ship. Um, and just to let everybody know, the image you're looking at is not the launching of the frigate Essex. Unfortunately, there was no contemporary painting uh, or, or any image done, um, even a, a, a woodcut, a sketch, anything, of the frigate Essex's launch. Uh, everybody was so enthralled um, by this event that they just wanted to watch. Um, you know, I guess they were all in the moment uh, and, and weren't thinking for, for posterity's sake. Um, in this case, this is the closest we're going to get to of the launching of a vessel, uh, similar to the frigate Essex. It's the launching of a ship, Fame, uh, 1802. Um, the, the site of that, I would presume, is probably pretty close to uh, what is today um, now uh, India Wharf, or what would have been India Wharf, uh, the site of the power plant. Um, so that big bay that you're seeing over on the left-hand side there, um, just beyond uh, the ship um, and the flags, uh, my guess is that, that was the area that was all filled in. Um, for the harbor power for the uh, Salem Harbor Power Station to be built upon. Um, interestingly, some of the social conventions um, can be learned from this painting. The men and the women they gathered separately. Um, when the ships were being launched, the women gathered with all the with all the children. Um, the young boys were trying to get as close as they can to, to see the action, and then the men, of course, gathering in their own groups as well too. It was a it was a gendered affair, interestingly enough. But ultimately, uh, the men and the women both. Uh, would always come down in droves. And in fact, on the launching day, September 13th of 1799, there were supposedly as many as 12,000 people watching all along the edges of Salem Harbor, Winter Island, Derby Wharf, uh, effectively anywhere that you could get a view of this vessel being launched. Um, people from as far north as even uh, uh, Haverhill, Gloucester, um, this was a regional affair. And uh, when you're launching a vessel uh, 850 tons, um, you want to make sure that you're not going to miss that. And so the ship here depicted is, is obviously quite a bit smaller, um, but we can see way off in the distance there, uh, in fact, the, uh, the barracks hut of uh, what was then um, uh, Fort William, uh, very, very soon to be designated uh, Fort Pickering uh, out on Winter Island there. And so uh, just beyond those rocks, you can see uh, right there on the coast of Winter Island uh, would have actually been the cove of where the frigate Essex was built. And so this image is a, a beautiful one. And uh, thank you for the Peabody Essex Museum uh, for, for Letting me share this. So the ship was built. Um, she had just been launched. Uh, of course, there was still some more work to be done. And the man who largely got the job done was Captain Edward Preble. Preble, Preble, I'm not sure the exact pronunciation. Uh, I'll leave it up to, uh, to him and his family, I guess, to correct me on that one. Um, Edward Preble was a remarkable captain. This guy was a, he, he lived and breathed the, the sea. Um, he was born uh, in Massachusetts. Um, or, uh, well, I mean, Maine, Portland, Maine, um, served in, in uh, what was then the Massachusetts uh, uh, Naval Militia, um, the Maine Naval Militia, um, served on a number of vessels, um, was incredibly important uh, during the Revolutionary War as, as a young officer. Well, not incredibly important. He, he, was, he was an important guy. He learned the ropes, and um, he was kind of a taskmaster. Um, he, he was fair, he was even handed, but he did run a, a pretty tight ship. And um, one of his early records, uh, in fact, uh, basically the day that he arrived in Salem, uh, gives us a really interesting idea of, of just how far along the ship was. And um, before I read the quote, let me answer this question. Treble. So, treble. There we go. Thanks, Carol. So, I found the ship moored between her two bowers in five fathoms water, muddy bottom, about half a league from the town. The flagstaff on Port, Port Pickering bearing northeast by east three cables length, and a cable is 600 feet, so about 1,800 feet from Port Pickering. Distant off, our distant off, shore to length, two cables length from the spot from which she was built. So about 1,800 feet from the fort, about 1,200 feet from where she was built. 
Um, her iron and shingle ballast and part of her water on board has been loaded. Her masts and spars all in place, rigged with her standing and most of her running rigging. So much of the, the, the lower uh, woodworking, all the lower spars, and then a lot of the, uh, the lower rigging had been installed. Um, all of the joiners and much of the carpenters, smiths, and painters work to be done. So she may have been fully built, but she probably wasn't very pretty. Um, she was not painted. Uh, none of the interior joinery work of the cabins um, had been finished. And so there was obviously still quite a bit more to be done. And uh, of course he arrived and he ordered the top gallant yards to be sent down, likely for an inspection or for possibly for, for them to be redone. So Preble um, almost immediately upon arriving uh, gets to work. Um, besides um, um, ordering the top gallant yards down, in fact, he gets into a little bit of a, a disagreement um, with, uh, with, with uh, John Gould, uh, who ended up doing the, uh, or James Gould, who ended up doing the, uh, the gun carriages. Almost immediately after the, the guns were mounted uh, on those carriages, they were found to be too tall, and he apparently got into quite a bit of a disagreement with him in the local pub. Um, at that point, uh, Preble was still uh, living on shore, uh, given that the, the cabins of the, uh, the Essex were not built yet. And uh, he ultimately overheard that this guy Gould, who built the cannons, was in the tavern, and apparently got into quite a bit of an argument. And uh, that argument was picked up in a, a few different stories, in fact. And there's even a uh, a novel uh, that, that's called *The Salem Frigate*. Uh, it's a fictional novel um, about the frigate Essex, and in fact, that argument even appears in that fictional novel. Um, so apparently, a few folks knew about this. Um, that Mr. Gould was taken to task by Preble um, for for not having done a very good job on constructing those gun carriages. Some of the other previous, uh, some of the other last jobs that Preble had to, to do the finishing touches for. Outfitting the ship for war. Of course, getting these cannons, uh, which were all supplied by the United States Navy, um, the subscription fund was to pay for the ship and one set of sails. It did not include for the cannons, for the weaponry, for any of the powder, um, nor for the provisions, in fact. So that $75,000 uh, um, was really for the construction of the ship rather than for the arming of the ship. And uh, of course, to have a vessel of war, you need some armament. Um, the frigate Essex, she carried 26 12-pound cannon. And when I say a 12-pound cannon, I'm not saying the cannon weighs 12 pounds. Of course, if you're looking at a, a steel, uh, a, a, a cast iron cannon, um, as we have down there in the lower left, um, that weighs a lot more than, than 12 pounds. We're talking between 1,600 pounds and around 1,900 pounds, some of them even weighing 20 pounds if they were thicker, thicker iron. Uh, and they came from a number of sources, in fact. Some of them captured off of the ship um, uh, during the Revolutionary War that was bound to Halifax. A few of the others actually purchased from the British um, uh, in the early 1790s. Um, in fact, it ended up being that every single gun outfitted on the frigate Essex um, ended up being a British-made gun. Um, so it's kind of interesting that um, I'm not sure they were the exact cannons used in the War of 1812 later on uh, when we fought the British, um, but initially all the cannons outfitted on the Essex uh, were British made. Uh, besides the 26 12 pound cannons, she carried 10 6 pound cannon, um, firing a 6 pound cannonball. And um, I forgot to mention the 12 pound refers to the weight of the cannonball. Um, a cannonball about maybe yay size would be a 12 pounder, a 6 pounder, a little bit smaller than that. Um, these were solid iron uh, cannonballs and obviously uh, capable of quite a bit of destruction. Um, besides the cannon armament, uh, you had naval small arms. You had about 100 cutlasses, 100 boarding pikes, and approximately 150 firearms between different muskets and pistols um, were supplied to the Essex uh, for her initial cruise um, into the Indian Ocean. And uh, the reproduction there is actually a, a, a reproduction of a French cannon um, that is on the uh, beautiful French uh, reproduction ship, the Amiens. And um, the crew of the Frigate Essex uh, consisted of Captain Preble, of course. Uh, he had three lieutenants, a first, second, and third lieutenant. Um, he had about 10 midshipmen, approximately. Uh, the number fluctuated. And about 300 crewmen, which again fluctuated, and at any point between 25 to 40 Marines, um, who about half of which came from a detachment in Boston, and then the remainder of those uh, 25 to 40 Marines arrived upon her stop in Newport, Rhode Island at the commencement of her first cruise. Um, additionally, there could have been as many as a dozen shipped boys. Um, shipped boys were young boys who were often uh, looking to, to join either the Navy or the Merchant Marine. And um, being too young to hold any official position, they would serve as either um, powder monkeys running powder up and down uh, from, from, the, from the, the magazine. 
um, or any number of jobs, uh, cleaning, um, you know, they were there to learn was the main idea. And uh, the image there actually shows the USS Constitution um, boarding pipe team drill. And um, interestingly enough, um, they still practice that. And if anybody has been to the uh, Salem Maritime Festival, you may have actually seen them doing a cannon drill or doing uh, the pipe drill as well, um, which would have been identical to the, uh, to the practices of the USS Essex. And of course, she eventually departs Salem. Farewell to Salem. On uh, 6 a.m. on December 22nd, 1799, she finally departs Salem. Why so late? She was launched in, uh, in September. She doesn't depart until December. Um, why the delay? In fact, for pretty much, she was ready to go from, 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 ready to, from, from the beginning of December. She could have departed probably even December 1st. Um, what held her up so much was ultimately Benjamin Seymour. Um, the casting of the shot of the cannonballs for the ship, it took exponentially longer to probably get them cast, but more importantly, to have them delivered from New York uh, all the way to, to Massachusetts, which was unbeknownst uh, to either Joseph Waters or um, um, uh, Edward Preble at the time. So interestingly, um, she was ready to go, but uh, she needed her armament. She needed those cannonballs. And then by around December 15th, 16th, there was another major storm. Um, the conditions were too poor for her to leave harbor, and she ultimately had to delay until the 22nd. So if not for those cannonballs, um, she may have been able to get underway and, uh, and along to Newport for her first cruise um, even earlier than that. And um, a few other um, little tidbits that I'll, I'll, I'll share with you um, before turning it over for, uh, for some questions. Um, Paul Revere, in fact, um, as I mentioned uh, earlier, he was one of the other folks who caused a little bit of a delay and almost throughout the whole process, in fact. Um, Paul Revere, he, he actually overextended himself. Um, he took on, in fact, on this date, May 17th, um, 1798, um, or no, 1799, 221 years ago today, um, he actually was visited by Joseph Waters, the naval agent, because he was so far behind in delivering the copper spikes for the hull of the ship. And in fact, um, Waters went down there to Boston to, to visit uh, with, with Paul Revere, and uh, he sorted out the issue. Well, Ichabod Nichols, uh, who was on the Frigate Essex Committee, had simultaneously um, hired Paul Revere to forge copper spikes for another ship that Ichabod Nichols was involved with, with his business partner, also on the Frigate Essex Committee, Benjamin Hodges. So it did not help the fact that uh, Nichols was coming to, to, to Revere uh, with a second request for the same exact item with a similar partner for the similar time frame, um, the ship active, uh, as it was known. And so um, maybe it's not entirely fair to lay all the blame at Paul Revere's feet, um, but regardless, the delay uh, did occur. And um, I think that covers most of my notes. Um, and I'll finish with the, uh, the Joseph Howard painting. This is the only known contemporary image of the frigate Essex. And um, as such, uh, we, we should treat this as, as largely accurate. Um, Joseph Howard, as I mentioned, was the, the son of um, John Howard, uh, the sailmaker. So again, all the sails you're, see you're seeing there on the ship um, would have actually been made by Joseph Howard. Um, the other uh, figurehead you can see up there, uh, the, the trail board just below that um, with uh, some flowers and uh, ultimately the stern board, which almost undoubtedly would have had a McIntyre eagle adorning it. And uh, with that, um, I will turn it over to some questions. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> hey. Thank you. Well done. Very good. Yeah, muted us. I thought you muted us too. All right, Jeff. Great job. Any questions? Um. Uh, yeah. Any questions? Yeah. Before we start, let me just do a quick scan through the chat to see if I missed any of the questions. Um, there, there was a question about the Hannah, I think, I forwarded to you. Someone wanted to know how the Hannah fits into the history, since it's 
Yeah, so the HANA was um, for the, uh, the, what was actually at that point, the Continental Navy. There was no United States Navy. Yeah, and so yeah. the HANA, um, we're talking almost 20 years earlier than this. Um, George Washington, of course, needing a Navy and uh, the gentleman from Marblehead being the best uh, to, to, to affect that. Um, he hired John Glover to outfit one of the vessels uh, as a ship of war. And so that's why she's known as the first vessel. Um, I am not going to weigh in on whether Beverly or Marblehead was the site <laughs> of the birth of the Navy. Uh, I'm going to leave that for, uh, for I believe, uh, Bob Booth. And um, who's, who's doing the other one? That's going to be in September. Um, so we'll be looking forward to that lecture uh, to, to ultimately decide. David. The birth of the David. Navy. Bob Booth and David. Oh, and David Goss, yes. Yeah, so got, yeah, so so yeah, so the Hannah is a, a little bit earlier than the frigate Essex. Mm -hmm. we're, we're talking uh, quasi war okay. 1799 through the War of 1812. That was the career of the frigate Essex. So um, after the, uh, the you know the federal period of the United States, uh, John Adams, uh, John Adams's presidency, and then ultimately uh, George, uh, Thomas Jefferson's presidency. Oh, let me take a look. I got some more questions coming in. Um, was the Essex armed the same with 12 pounders in the War of 1812? Very good question, Mark. Um, the frigate Essex was not armed with the same mm -hmm. 12 pounders during the War of 1812, uh, unfortunately. Um, so I'm going to leave this for my next slide here. Because um, Colonel Tim Pickering, as, he, as much of an advocate for carronades as he was, he was wrong. Um, during the War of 1812, um, the frigate Essex was equipped with only carronades, which is a short range, uh, basically like a shotgun. Um, they, they were 32 pound cannons with exceptionally short muzzles. Um, they were not long guns. They were not accurate. They were they were a shotgun, a smasher. They were even called. And unfortunately, when the frigate Essex um, had to face off against some British ships, she did not have the range of weaponry needed uh, to keep them at bay, and ultimately was captured because of that. Um, so unfortunately, no. I, I wish she had 12 pounders during the War of 1812 because she might have survived. Mm. Uh, what else? Um, the ship was copper clad. I totally forgot to mention that. Yes. The ship was copper clad, um, the entire hull. Um, she was not the first copper clad naval vessel. Um, that, that they were coppering vessels for a long, long time. Um, the copper was not made by Revere for the hull. Paul Revere was forging the malleable copper spikes to fasten the hull together. Um, the sheet copper uh, was not known, the manufacture of sheet copper was not known in the colonies at that, that time. It was actually purchased from England. Um, and the United States Navy uh, in Philadelphia, mm -hmm. they provided the stores mm -hmm. of the copper mm -hmm. sheathing mm -hmm. the hull. Um, so no, it was not, um, <coughs> it, it was copper clad, but the copper was not manufactured by Revere, at least for the hull. Um, uh, I think Anne has her hand up. Oh yeah. Thanks yeah. for a wonderful presentation, Jeff. I'm not sure that I got it. What was the lifetime of service of Essex? And then what became of the Essex? Yeah, so um, I, I'm not going to go into this too much because I'm, I'm, it, it's the subject of another lecture I'm ah. going to be doing later. <laughs> Doesn't want to sleep. Uh, well, it's <laughs> so from uh, obviously December of 1799 until uh, yeah. 1814 uh, during the War of 1812. Um, she was captured by the British off of Chile. Oh. And uh, unfortunately, I, I attribute that to a couple of things. Um, the vessel had so many changes done to it that it didn't perform as well as she did when she was first launched. An anecdote actually that I forgot to share was, um, of course, George Crown and Shield, uh, uh, the salty old guy that he was, mm -hmm. when the frigate Essex was launched and was finally leaving Salem Harbor in, in December of 99, um, he was still salty and he sent out at the exact same time the ship Belisarius on a race. And so he sent out the Belisarius at the exact moment that the Essex was leaving as an unofficial race to prove himself right. Well, it didn't play out that way. Uh, ultimately, on the Essex's uh, uh, initial voyage, um, the Essex departed, um, as I said, in December. She arrived in Newport about, I think, six days later, um, towards the end of December. And uh, interestingly enough, um, she ended up beating the Belisarius, going about six knots to her four. Um, and that's, that's under very low sail and a very, very deep draft. Um, and so later on in her career, the frigate Essex was known to have made as much as actually 12 or even 14 knots, uh, which is exceptionally fast. Um, and so uh, that was one of the funny things that even the uh, old man Crown and Shield, um, he, he didn't acknowledge it in his letters, but uh, it's known uh, between Edward Preble, um, uh, um, 
uh, Benjamin Stoddart, the Secretary of the Navy, uh, those guys knew what mattered, and that was the Essex was, was much faster than the ships that the Crown and Shield were trying to, to donate to the Navy. What else we got? Um, um, oh, wait. Jo I'm yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Jim, uh, Jim Boyd had his hand no. up. Yeah. No? He waved. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Hi, yeah. Hi, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I just wanted to add that uh, white oak was so durable. That's why it was used. And yeah. even recently, it was used for um, lobster traps when they were still making them out of wood. Hmm. And it, it has unbelievable water resistant characteristics. One of the things I can't say definitively that the Essex was made of uh, swamp sure. white oak as opposed to regular white oak. Um, but one of the really incredible characteristics of swamp white oak as opposed to regular white oak, it is much more water resistant because it mm -hmm. grows in more um, aquatic conditions. It's actually, it typically grows in marshland. Um, it can even be known to grow in brackish water or, or partially brackish water, um, you know, uh, in a tidal zone. So it's, it's an incredibly durable tree. And um, basically, if you're able to find them around Massachusetts, it's not very common around here. It's actually much more common around Ohio, Kentucky, um, Michigan area, Indiana. Uh, that's where swamp white oak is, is uh, Illinois is far better known. Uh, it does grow around Massachusetts. Um, and the way you can tell the difference between uh, um, swamp white oak and regular white oak, uh, white oak trees are more solid green. The whole, the top of the leaves, the bottom of the leaves will be the same color. Uh, swamp white oak, the bottom of the leaves are much more silvery. And so when you see the tree in the wind, it almost looks like it's changing colors. And, and that's actually reflected in the Latin name of swamp white oak, which is Quercus bicolor. As opposed to, just, um, <laughs> uh, I think it's what Quercus alti is, is, is a regular white oak. Did you need that? Yeah. No, I didn't. No, I didn't. Who's next? Hello. Hey. Is it Robert or who's asking? <laughs> watching a Zoom lecture. Sounds like John. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> the Marine Society is in the house. <laughs> oh, okay. Do we have any other questions? I just, yeah, can I ask? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Oh, can we, can you help? Great. Yes, we're on mute. Yeah. Yeah, you're oh, unmuted. Oh yeah. my goodness, how Johnny wonderful. Wants to say something. Johnny's going first, okay. Yeah. yeah. I think he's on a personal call. Oh, yes. Oh, oh, right. oh well, okay. John, John. <laughs> well, Jeff, Jeff. <laughs> I just want to compliment you on slipping in a couple wonderful puns when you were describing <laughs> white oak. <laughs> oh, yeah. Anyways, I'm going to go out on a limb. <laughs> <laughs> I caught that. I thought it was quite, quite so good. Like, that's good. Oh, 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 when you were talking about construction, oh, yeah, the, yeah, the, when you were talking about, uh, yeah, one thing that would work, but then, yeah, yeah, Captain just, Joseph Waters, Joseph Waters, um, just, just trying to link up some names, Waters and Brown, yes. mm -hmm. Brown Street. Yeah. Is there any connection to that? That's yeah. a, I'm not um, sure. I would presume it's the same uh, family. Um, the okay. Waters family has, has always lived in Salem. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. street, uh, over yeah. on the other side of uh, the bridge, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, what do you call it? Uh, Valvoline. I get it. Uh, just behind Valvoline is a water right. street that comes off of um, um, what? Uh, Mason Street. I gotta tell Johnny he's on. Yeah, where is he? I just yeah. muted someone who was being noisy. Oh, good. Yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There you go. Yeah. No. It's it's undoubtedly the same family, uh, the Waters family in Salem. They they were here for for a long, long time. And I presume Waters and Brown must must be related. I have one more question. He has one. Tim has one more. Question. Oh, sorry. One more question, Jeff. Um, you know, when you think of breaking up a ship, and nowadays they they seem to end up somewhere on the coastline of India or Bangladesh, and it's giant pieces of metal. What would they do? Because I never really understood how long the life expectancy of a ship was, but I would assume parts of it would fail, uh, especially below the waterline or maybe what we saw here locally with um, the friendship with rotting and whatnot. But what would they salvage? Because um, I would have thought they'd use great wood and whatnot. They did. In fact, um, the USS, I believe it's the Constellation, um, was captured by the British off of uh, Marblehead in the War of 1812. And there's apparently an entire mill in England made from the timbers of the constellation. Or no, it's not the constellation. It's the, um, oh, shoot. 
United States? I think it's the United States. I think it was the United States. Whichever one lost to the Shannon. I'm forgetting the exact name of the vessel. Yeah. It's one of the original six. Um, but yeah, it lost to the Shannon right off the coast of, of Marblehead. Um, unfortunately, we can't claim a great naval victory off our coast. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but that, the, the timbers were used. And um, the, the last little tidbit that I'll give, I don't want to spoil too much of the ending of the story, but the Essex, after being captured by the British, did end up in Ireland. And uh, supposedly they found one of the kedge anchors um, in Dunleary Harbor in Ireland that they believe to be a Salem iron manufactory. I believe to be a Salem iron manufactory uh, kedge anchor. Wow. I can't say it for sure. It's, it's speculation, but um, there could be an, an, you know, an iron anchor over there because um, you ha they actually have records of how many anchors the Essex lost. And apparently the Essex never lost her kedge anchor. So presuming that the kedge anchor that she started with Went to her with went with her to England. That was probably the same one that ended up in Dunleary mm -hmm. Harbor. It's a stretch, but um, I like to think that that's the case. Yeah. Okay. The uh, timbers. Uh... Uh, what do you got, Steve? Oh, oh. I thought he said something. I mm -hmm. thought Ma Mary Whitney might have had a question. Her hand was up, but I don't. Yeah, I know. Okay. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> okay. Hi. Yeah. Go ahead. Hi. So, uh, Jeff, uh, just wondering, um, yeah, you have such a facility with the uh, information. It was a great presentation. I'm curious what inspired you to dig so deeply into the subject matter. Um, at this point, I'm not even sure where it all started. Um, <laughs> I've, I've always enjoyed Salem's history and particularly the, the maritime history of, of just the United States. And uh, the age of sail is something I've always been uh, intrigued by more in the past few years than when I was younger. Um, and then as I was, you know, digging into just different things here and there, um, the Frigate Essex kept popping up as this, this vessel that always got short shrift. Um, it, you know, it, it had this incredible career uh, during the War of 1812. Um, and I, I won't say much more because uh, it'll spoil the next lecture, but um, <laughs> the, uh, she, she never gets her, her due, um, you know, because she was captured at the end. And so uh, the earliest part of the story, in my opinion, is, is the most exciting and, and um, realizing how much uh, local effort went into getting it done and um, how much of that local effort ultimately contributed to her, her success and, and her, her longevity. Um, you know, that, the white oak beams that were grown right here in Essex County. Um, you know, the, um, the copper that was made by Paul Revere in Boston, um, you know, the, the, the duck that was manufactured um, and spun, literally, I can look out my window and see the site uh, of where the Salem, uh, um, the Salem duck factory was um, over, uh, over near the Broad Street Cemetery. So it's, it's pretty cool um, being right in the middle of all these things that, you know, we built a Navy ship, you know, uh, people always think of, you know, um, you know, the Four River Shipyard in Quincy, but no, we built a Navy ship, you know, and, and that's, that's, for me, it's pretty exciting. And, and you know, the, the trade is exciting too, but um, war is a little bit more, you know, especially the War of 1812 and, and the, the Revolutionary War um, are, are some of the most exciting parts of our history, so. It's great, thanks. It was really interesting. You could just talk. Yeah. Oh, Jeff? Yeah. I, sorry to keep asking questions. Uh, the, the uh, Paul Revere, you, you were saying that he didn't make the cladding on this ship. Mm -hmm. And right, I think it was right around 1800 or there, not far off there, he got a patent for uh, a rolling uh, yes. doing rolling mill. So it would have been I mean, very yeah. close. So he might have like lost the contract. Was there any, was there any connection here or did he just, the technology just hadn't made it here yet? It was lo literally one year behind. In 1790, one, okay. he didn't have the technology. In 1796 was when he learned how to make malleable copper because previously all right. the copper he spikes for ships because you can't use iron on on copper because right. apparently it creates uh, a magnetic field. Galvanic, uh, galvanic action, yeah. Yeah, it, it, you can't use those two together. So wherever you have yeah. copper sheathing, um, you need copper spikes. And previously they were a composite of copper and tin, which were really right. brittle versus yeah. a pure copper, a malleable copper, um, ultimately was, was strong enough and soft That's enough the um, that yeah. they wouldn't break. And so that was what Revere, you know, kind of made his name on right, in terms of shipbuilding, um, ultimately providing all the spikes for, for the USS New Hampshire, the USS Constitution, um, a number of other uh, famous vessels. And so um, it was only about a year later that he, he learned from apparently from someone in England 
um, about how to roll copper uh, and, and the machine. Right, co roll copper. Yeah. yeah. One other question, Jeff, I never heard anything about that Salem Iron Works. And I'm just curious because um, we all know about the Saugus. And usually in those days, you know, the reason they had these iron factories, was it because of the bog iron up there in that those big swamps up there? Do you have no, anything? I don't think so. Um, at that point, I'm, I'm assuming most of it would have probably been recycled or just pig iron that was being imported. Um, okay. There's no record of, of any mining in that area. Um, you know, yeah. We're talking 100 years after Saugus. Yeah, yeah. Was, was yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so it probably, if, the, if it existed, it had already been grabbed. Yeah, so the, the reason they picked the Waters River was it was a phenomenal tidal area. Tidal area, yeah. Um, the amount of water that flows in there is, is, is much less. We're talking right behind um, the, um, um, the Partners Health on Endicott Street there, where the Endicott Pear Tree is. Um, yeah. That whole area used to go a lot farther uh, towards what's now like the, the North Shore Mall and the Liberty Tree Mall. Yeah. Um, so, you know, millions and millions of gallons of water flowing in and out, and ultimately you dam that up, um, you can get a lot of power to, to, to run the trip hammer. Um, and there was an image I didn't include actually. It was a really, it was apparently a, a, a cast, a, 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 an iron cast of the interior of the ironworks, uh, showing the trip hammer and the forges, um, yeah. and ultimately all of that being powered by, by, the, by the mill. By the tide mill, yeah. yeah. Jeff, uh, sorry, last one on that one. It, it, do you know how old how old was that business and and who? It was. Owned, it had been there for a while. In fact, um, the, the making anchors for the Essex was was not a new thing. Yeah. Um, I don't know the exact date of when it started, but I would say maybe before the revolution. Okay. For sure. Thanks. Mm -hmm.